Hi, Paul. Thanks for joining us again. You are actually the first repeat guest for our guest AMA. I appreciate it. Thanks, Pratik. Thanks, Jerome. Yeah, and uh, a lot changed. It's been an interesting few months since we were since we discussed last time the backdrop and things have changed in the in the market. Things have changed for what we're focused on. Unfortunately, last time we were talking, uh, we had a lot of assignments that were focused on growth capital raises and uh, M and A from an opportunistic standpoint from companies, and that's transitioned into now we're focused on more restructurings. We have three live mandates right now in the mining industry. Uh, two are, have been publicly announced, Compute North and Argo, uh, and there's a third one we're working on. Uh, we've been behind the scenes working on those, which is, it's disappointing that that's what we have to do. I mean, I, I guess it's good for business, but it's not what we want to do. We want to be part of a thriving and growing um, ecosystem. So we're trying to lean in here. We're going to keep, continue to lean in here, but it's um, it's definitely frustrating and a setback for the industry what happened this fall absolutely so last time you joined us we didn't have the biggest surprise of 2022 revealed to us yet and now we do yeah so post ftx i thought we had i thought we had i thought we had <laughs> yeah had we all thought we had no more surprises so, but here we go one yeah. more so post ftx in in your opinion what are institutional investors looking at differently right now what are they considering different than before? Yeah, I mean, it, unfortunately, the FTX situation is a continuation of what happened earlier in the year. Um, and it really is the case that the, the failures of 2022 were squarely failures of centralization. They were failures because companies were not actually using distributed ledger technologies. Um, it's, it is interesting that all of these institutions um, you know, they were centralized uh, exchanges and brokers um, bringing customers to blockchain, but they weren't actually using blockchain. And what usually failed was traditional finance. Uh, it was a failure of leverage. It was a failure of understanding risk controls and counterparty risk. So these were, you know, age old financial problems, but it really puts a black eye on the industry. And so what's changed from an institutional standpoint is, unfortunately, when you go from a two trillion market cap industry to sub one trillion, fortunately, we're slightly back over that again after this recent squeeze. And I call it a squeeze. I'm not convinced we're out of the woods yet, but it's relevant. I mean, part of the reason Ken Griffin from Citadel admitted his mistake earlier in the year from not embracing cryptos, he said, hey, listen, if you have a two trillion market cap, uh, market cap industry, obviously it's real. Um, well, when we go back below 1 trillion, all of a sudden, does that change the parameters? The liquidity right now, it's a lot less than it was uh, earlier in the uh, 2022. Part of the reason why the squeeze was so pronounced this past weekend. Uh, the market depth is pretty light. And I think a lot of institutional investors have put the pause button on until there's answers from a regulatory standpoint, which you know we can get into that in more detail. But I think, unfortunately, while the urgency for regulation has increased, I'm not convinced the timing has improved. For, for a question to that, um, would you say that perhaps institutional investors, especially funds, will perhaps change their way to do due diligence or maybe they, they are thinking about doing it? Because like you mentioned, right, the issue was kind of Web2 security aspect and Web2 processes, which needs to be done, right, for a centralized company. <clears throat> Well, I think the problem is um, it, there, there's really no clear case for what they should do from a custody standpoint. A lot of the, the non-crypto native funds typically rely on their prime brokers to, to do all the trading, right? And none of the traditional financial institutions who are prime brokers, the Morgan Stanley's, the Goldman, they, they can't actually offer direct custody solutions for their funds. I think we talked about this last time, but that rule SAB 121, which essentially means the brokers have to treat their customers' assets as their own assets and liabilities, it's been a game changer that made a lot of institutions put their pencils down. And even the attempt to try to um, outsource that custody is, is not um, being accepted by the SEC. So it really is tricky. So what you have to do as a fund is you have to then set up your own accounts elsewhere and you know, there's a lot of companies that can help you with that. And some of the 
innovative folks who said, okay, I'll, I'll just go work with the, the coin bases of the world, which seems to be obviously one of the most regulated, uh, cleanest plays, but it's still a centralized entity. And we, we thought FTX was, was okay, uh, you know, six months ago. So it still makes a lot of institutions uh, second guess themselves. I mean, it's, it's good to see folks like Fidelity leaning in. Um, so that, that's a positive, but uh, until we get regulatory clarity, I just don't think you're going to get too much incremental institutional money coming in uh, that's not dedicated crypto native industry players. Interesting. So you've mentioned about regulation, which leads basically to second question. Um, how do you think the role or do you think the role of regulatory agencies will evolve in the coming uh, year? Or is there any advancement in the regulation side that you feel like will be really important to watch? Yeah, if we thought rule by enforcement in 2022 is bad, it's going to be a lot worse in 2023 because it takes time to bring cases. And a lot of what the SEC was working on last year and actually, actually the CFTC, you're going to see a step up proactively in um, in rulings. We think that uh, at KBW that there's an increased chance or likelihood, not even a chance, we think it's very probable, in fact, that uh, the SEC will go ahead and, and list um, most securities, I mean, sorry, most assets as securities, which is going to impact the likes of Coinbase. They're, they've got a lot of uh, coins on there that will be listed as securities. So we think that's coming in, in addition to enforcement. I mean, I think we saw this morning, Nexo just agreed to pay $45 million for, for issues. Um, and I, I, that's just going to continue to happen. At this point, I think we just need an answer. Who's in control of what and move forward, get the rules of engagement, get the rules of the road and, and push forward, um, you know, particularly as it relates to any of the centralized entities that are going to participate in the space. We think both the SEC and the CFTC will be jockeying for position here, and uh, there'll be a little bit of a game of one-upsmanship in terms of proving that they can enforce um, most likely the CFTC will handle the commodity labeled assets like Bitcoin, but the SEC is going to handle most of the other assets, which they'll deem securities. And what makes me nervous is if the SEC is then going to be able to eventually release some of these security securities to become commodities to shift over to the CFTC, what's, why is it in their interest to actually do so? So they probably hold on to these a little bit longer. So hopefully we'll get a proactive ruling for for what the specific parameters are to go from a security to a commodity uh, to shift it back over to the CFTC. But uh, I'm just not that encouraged because about the regulatory answers, knowing a lot of people in DC, having direct uh, dialogue with them, it's clear that they're more focused on fact-finding right now than on proactively coming up with the rules. I think we've taken a little bit of a step back. Part of the reason is a lot of the folks in Congress want to lay low um, I saw some crazy numbers, 196 of the 535 members of Congress and Senate uh, received donations from uh, SBF, uh, Ryan Salame, and Shad Singh, and um, across both the Democrat and Republican parties. So I think those folks are going to lay low and not going to be super eager to raise their hand and, and push forward legislation. They'll vote on stuff, but I don't think it's going to be in their interest to, to really bring it to the everybody's attention. And then you, you even saw with the attempt to get a Republican House Speaker, it took 15 times to get a Republican House Speaker elected with McCarthy, who, by the way, unfortunately received some money from SBF. And I think when you see the dynamics of what's going on in Congress, it's just the chances of actually getting the rules of the road have been pushed back. And we were most encouraged about stablecoin legislation coming. And that's probably taken a step back because if you're going to determine what to do with stable coins, you have to determine what's going to happen with the banks. How do they factor into it? And you also have to decide what's the impact on the decision for whether there's going to be a, a CBDC for, for your, your country. And, and right now, I don't think there's a, a decision on that front. I think most people don't want to see a, an official CBDC in the US. They'd rather see a private stable coin solution. But if the stable coin solution has to involve the banking regulators, we just saw on January 2nd or 3rd, a joint statement by the FDIC, the OCC, and the Fed 
which essentially said, do not enter. <laughs> that, that's essentially my takeaway. It was basically the regulator saying, look at how bad the, the crypto industry failures impacted their own space last year. Thank goodness we didn't have them really incorporated into the banking system. So let's, let's pump the brakes. Let's not have the financial system directly touch any crypto assets. So really the only touch points so far for the banking system have been it's been the on-ramp, off-ramp, the fiat uh, balances for the crypto industry. And even there, we've seen some massive dislocation. Uh, they haven't really seen any true loss content, but you've seen massive deposit outflows. And traditionally, when you see those types of deposit flows, usually that would create failures within the banking system. It's amazing that Silvergate Bank it saw 70% of their deposits flow out in the fourth quarter. And they were able to manage the process because they had plenty of liquidity, but it did send a signal to the regulators that they need to put their guards up and guard rails up for the banking industry as relates to crypto. So unfortunately, we've taken a step back. And so I'm not as encouraged by the potential for stablecoin legislation in 1Q, which I thought was going to happen. And I, I think the, the timing for just broader rules has gotten pushed back because of the, the legislative process and uh, legislators will probably want to focus on fact-finding and lay low as it relates to all the donations that were received. Very thorough response. Just a, a quick note. Uh, I, I feel like, you know, it's pretty much a scapegoat to say that, you know, crypto is kind of hurting traditional finance. I mean, we're talking about an industry, which is like what you, you just said, right? Just below the one trillion mark when yeah. you have an economy, <clears throat> world economy, which is multiples of that right my personal opinion is that it's like the scapegoat right they're basically saying crypto has hurt a lot of companies in traditional finance world the ties that they have with it just to to probably not hide the fact that the inflation is hurting a lot of companies as well but trying essentially to be the, the, the scapegoat that's just my, my personal so, opinion i agree Jerome. my issue is um it may be the scapegoat it also gives them the firepower to go to, to, to Congress and say, hey, right. look at what we just did. We had pumped the brakes. We had prevented the banking system from directly touching these assets. We prevented the banking system from lending in this space in earnest. And um, thank goodness we did that because it didn't spill over. And we haven't seen a spillover. Um, and that's, yeah. that's my fear is it's, it's going to continue to create the reason why the regulators will just put up guardrails to prevent the integration. And so far, the only space that we've seen comfort from the regulators is private permission blockchain. We saw Jamie Dimon and Davos uh, yesterday, the day before, talking about how Bitcoin is still the Ponzi and junk and all this. And then he turns around and says, but distributed ledger is fantastic. Distributed ledger technology, blockchain is fantastic, which is kind of double speak and self-serving, but that's kind of clear to me near term that most of the solutions will be in private permission blockchain. And I think there'll be a lot of focus on the tokenization of real world assets and create kind of side chains on the open protocols to interact. So um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier were that the institutions are suspicious of getting involved with any kind of centralized exchanges post FTX specifically. And one of the uh, quick fixes or solutions that was uh, touted was proof of reserves yep. and audits, proof of reserves for the centralized exchanges. So we had yep. a couple firms like Mazars or Mazars <clears throat> and Armanino do these kind of audits for centralized exchanges, which bailed out suddenly. Right. And, and none of the big four accounting firms are willing to do any of this work. Yeah. So what happens to the proof of reserves in the future? So I think one of the major issues is that the companies like uh, uh, Mazar and Ar Ar Armanino, they were just reliant on the information that was being submitted to them by the folks that they were doing the attest attestations for. Um, they don't themselves actually have on-chain analytics capabilities. And so it really creates reputational risk if the company that you're auditing or you're doing that to taste attestations for is giving you bad information. And so it's just not worth it. Um, so I think what we need to see is we need to see the big four and these auditors actually have their own 
on-chain analytics expertise and or have JVs with very good uh, companies in that industry so that they can actually go on and do the, the direct proof of reserves audits themselves so that they're unqualified, which means without caveats, as opposed to qualified, uh, which means with caveats, um, audits. And I think we will see that. Positively, Deloitte is actually one of the accounting firms that is leaning in. They are auditing the you know firms that they feel are, are, are clean. Coinbase has a big four. I saw, I read uh, in early January, Exodus switched from a digital asset native auditor to Deloitte. They just made that official switch in January. So we're starting to see uh, big fours who are willing to lean in. I just think that they need to continue to, to build out their on-chain analytics capabilities themselves. And part of the issue is Merkle Tree proof of reserves would be relatively straightforward to implement for many organizations in a way that mathematically provable and, and you know don't require auditing firms. The end goal is not to need auditors, but rather for the data to be able to be audited directly on chain by anyone. The bigger issue that we need to face near term and long term is how do you do proof of chain liabilities analysis? Because Binance could say, hey, listen, look, I just did a proof of reserve. I just you know did an on-chain analysis that showed you all, all the, the assets that, that we have or that are customers. But how do you prove what their liabilities are? So you kind of need the old school auditors to do that. And that's that's the disconnect. That's the issue that we need. So eventually we need to get to a point where all of those companies, and this goes back to what I was discussing before, how ironic it is that FTX and all these companies, Celsius and the Voyagers of the world, they were bringing the retail and the bringing in institutions to crypto, but they weren't actually using distributed technology, blockchain technology for, their, for most of their business. You know, yes, to do trading, but not for their client interactions or a lot of the, the transactions. So what we need to see is we need to see a shift towards using blockchain on both sides of the balance sheet. And that's one thing I'd even point out with, with, with Silvergate. It is interesting because I think they're a crucial part of the ecosystem. But longer term, I would like to see their SEND network use blockchain as opposed to just be a database. A database. Um, one, one bank who's doing it, a signature bank, on the other hand, with using Tacit, um, who created Signet, they do use blockchain. So at least you can, in turn, really, it is immutable, it's on-chain, and that is the direction of travel. I think, I think we need to see more companies use blockchain on both sides of the balance sheet. I'm pretty sure that Chainalysis or Chainlink might be working on something similar to, to that. That's for sure. And yeah. that's, in my opinion, <clears throat> probably being released uh, during this year because there's a lot of need for such a service yeah and that's that's interesting because it, it's interesting you brought that up because a lot of people complain about crypto businesses being solutions in search of a problem and i think on-chain analytics is there's clearly a problem and there's clearly a solution but i think there's a need for more companies than just chain analysis and elliptic uh, it's great that we have two industry leaders, but um, this is a, a huge growing space with a lot of capacity. I think there's a lot of smaller subscale players. I'm expecting to see a roll up of that space. I think there's different niches that can be focused on by these players. So that's one of the areas of the business I'm most ex excited about in 2023 and beyond. Besides just law enforcement, hopefully it's you know auditing firms, it's any institution that wants to get involved, they have either their own in-house on-chain analytics expertise, or they have good JVs with, with companies. And I don't think chain analysis and elliptic can be the solution for the entire industry globally. So I think there's room for more players on that front. Would that take away the anonymity of people on the blockchain? Would people have to, to reveal who they are in some way? Um, it depends. I mean, there are solutions that are being worked on. The concept of soul-bound tokens where you can get validation without actually revealing who you are on chain. Um, so there's ways around that. That's not the goal of the on-chain analytics here in terms of the proof of um, chain liabilities and reserves, but it, it's a delicate balance. I, I, you bring up a good point, Pratik, because part of the, the beauty of blockchain and the whole what Satoshi had was that it was about creating more 
anonymity and an ability to, to transact outside the controls of the government. But now we're seeing stuff like the OFAC sanctions and needing to identify specific transactions with specific people and then not being able to interact with those folks. And it is creating a situation where that anonymity is, uh, is uh, in question. I would have a final question that this one might be a bit more personal. What would be your prediction for 2023? Something that you're really looking forward or something that uh, it doesn't have to be you know, regulation or specific company and so on. Do you have a prediction that you're really looking forward this year? Or Yeah, uh, I just, I, I really do think that a major focus is going to continue to be on tokenizing real world assets. and. It will start with the industries where there's not powerful incumbents. Uh, that's part of the problem. I mean, just the case studies of, of how, for example, in China, you were able to buy food from a vendor 15 years ago with, uh, with your phone, and we're only starting to do it here in the States. And it's because you know we had a dedicated um, network with MasterCard and Visa, and just kind of that's the way people interacted. Over in China, they didn't really have the same network effect, so they were able to just leapfrog. And that's the same thing with why the U.S. was so slow to adopt a mobile even because we have telephone poles. So we already had the infrastructure. So when you look at the industry, I think people like Chad Gasparella from, from Paxos, his dream is to put the entire equity exchange and replace the DTC on chain. But it's hard to do so because you have to dislocate a lot of players. So where will we see it start? Well, we're, we're starting to see it in areas like tokenizing private equity assets, tokenizing private equity funds. We've seen funds like Securitize and others doing so. We noticed Apollo's doing that, KKR is doing that with their assets and some other players. So it's because there's not really a robust industry there. So it's got to start with these other smaller players. Now, unfortunately, there's not a lot of velocity of transactions in that space, but it's a start. And once we can get those proof cases, then we can can push to, to putting other assets with more velocity on it. So I do think we're going to continue to see that. Carbon credits, that obviously is a new space. So I feel like that has one of the better chances of moving to blockchain out of the gate because if there's a need to kind of standardize the credits, track the credits. I, I do think that the tokenizing of real world assets is, is where, where we're going to be. And I think stable coin, um, stable coins are not going away. I think stable coin, it's important because a lot of people who don't want to deal with the volatility of cryptocurrency assets like Bitcoin, there's going to be a preference to, to using stable coins. And it is interesting that people like Jack Dorsey, who has historically been a, a Bitcoin maxi, you know, he's trying to implement using the Lightning Network for Bitcoin but also to have an option for stable coins. And I think as we see that down the road, it's going to increase the, the, uh, it's increased the, the use cases. There's already huge use cases globally, but I think it'll use case, uh, increase the use cases here domestically as well. It will show that we might not need an actual government CBDC. We can have a private CBDC here in the States as a better option. Really fascinating, Paul. Always a great conversation with you. Jerome, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, just just one thing would be, uh, we are actually working our next report, uh, the one that will be after the next one, we'll be talking about impact finance and the counterparts that exist in blockchain, which is called regenerative finance. And we do believe, in which it ties back you know, to carbon credits and real world asset as well, tokenizing all of them. This is proving to be very interesting and there's a lot of uh, solution to most of the challenges that exist in the traditional finance um, part of this sector called impact finance. Well, thanks guys. We're gonna to continue to lean in here and embrace the suck. <laughs> and uh, and just, uh, we're gonna be here for the long haul in the space. And uh, I, I, I remain excited about the industry, perhaps, the realization of the centralized, the centralized problems is going to refocus the industry on, on really getting decentralized solutions, which I think needs to happen. Well, Paul, my hope is that there is no other 
crazy surprising event between our oh, this man. interview and your next interview with us so <laughs> Uh, if if yeah. DCG is still around, that's great. If DCG is not around, we might have another session on <laughs> on that, that bankruptcy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's only, it's only six hundred thirty three thousand bitcoins sitting in the Grayscale Trust. I think actually the Genesis, the Genesis cha uh, Chapter Eleven bankruptcy or prepaid bankruptcy. We'll see. We'll see how it uh, prepackaged bankruptcy. We'll see what how they do it. It kicks the can, and it actually part of the reason why we had that squeeze last last week is um, there's really no uh, immediate potential for for the bitcoin from the grayscale trust to, to come to the market all right all fellas right. thanks again look forward thank you to so much for joining our, thank our you Paul. Right. take care thank you bye